My name is Teresa Gellarducci. I'm the director of the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, and I'm the chair of the Economics Department at the New School for Social Research. Thank you very much for all coming tonight. Um, it is my pleasure to welcome you all here in the room and to welcome people who are watching online um, tonight. Hello, everybody online. And I encourage anybody in the audience um, to get out their cell phones. I, anybody who knows me knows this is hard for me to say. And um, you can tweet, I think that's the right verb, tweet during the, uh, during the conference. I know everybody I've talked to, um, Professor Gordon, is really interested in your work. And uh, a lot of people know that this event is happening. So you in the room and you online, um, please um, be sure to tweet. And the, um, the account is hashtag Gordon Econ. Hashtag Gordon Econ. One word. One word. Thank you. Um, the center that I am the director of, the Schwartz Center for Economic Policy Analysis, is dedicated to bringing forth the critical economics and heterodox economics that we do here at the, at the New School, both in Milano and at the New School for Social Research, into mainstream policy making, to lift up our work here and push it out to policy makers um, and to activists and to voters. David Gordon, who you will hear a lot about today, um, was the former director of the center. Um, it is my pleasure now to welcome Denny Gordon, who is a senior research scholar and professor emeriti of the City University of New York's criminal justice PhD program at John Jay College. Denny's illustrious career includes service as director of the Citizens Inquiry on Parole and Criminal Justice. Um, she was past president of the National Council on Crime and Delinquency. She has written extensively on crime, justice, and her latest book is on post-apartheid South Africa and the democracy and the transition there. So, Denny, thank you very much for coming and welcoming our students. Thank you. Greetings to you all. I'm so glad you're here. This is a wonderful audience and a wonderful occasion. Um, as you know, I am the widow of David Gordon, who was one of the founders of SIPA and a longtime professor at the New School in Economics. Uh, and uh, I'm also the sister-in-law of the speaker, Bob Gordon, whose work I think would be very exciting to David if he could discuss it with him and share it with him. And you will get a, a full introduction of Bob very soon. Um, and there's a third family connection this evening, which I just discovered this week. And that is that my mother-in-law, I clearly married into a very distinguished family of economics, e economists. My mother-in-law was one of the people on the Teresa's dissertation committee. <laughs> so <laughs> it really feels terrific. And, and I have a sense of being, in a sense, in a family here. Um, but that's not the only reason I'm up in front of you. Uh, I also wanted to say just a little bit about uh, the students who have been funded in part, very modestly, unfortunately, um, to work on their dissertations here at the New School by the David M. Gordon Fellowship, Dissertation Fellowship Fund. So I would like to introduce them very briefly. I have to read their PhD titles. Um, Alexander Gavorkian, is he here? Yes. I started with, I'm starting with you because you are a past recipient and you are now gainfully employed. <laughs> uh, uh, Alexander's PhD title was, in, was and is Innovative Fiscal Policy and Economic Development in Transition Economies, which is also the title for his book, which was republished this year in paperback. So this is definitely a success. Thank you. Um, uh, current recipients are Josh Greenstein. Could you put up your hand? You're there. Um, whose PhD topic is Growth and Distribution of Multidimensional Well-Being in Middle-Income Countries. He's looking at who's benefiting, benefiting from growth occurring in selected middle-income countries. Uh, and Raffaele Chape, is he here? She, sorry, um, 
her PhD, also a current recipient, her PhD topic is Wealth Inequality in the U.S., a study of the process of wealth accumulation and financial inequality, certainly very relevant for this evening's topic. And finally, Catherine Rechlin, who is a current right here, who is a current recipient. She is still working on a nice long title for her dissertation, <laughs> but she is a policy analyst at DEMOS, a public policy organization uh, that perhaps some of you know something about. But, and what I think is interesting given the, um, the, the intention of the pro for the products of SEPA is that she works on not only doing economic analysis at Demos, but in disseminating it. She appears before Congress. Um, she says here, this week she spoke alongside th three members of Congress in support of raising pay for low-wage workers. Her work has been featured on many, many media outlets, including, I was interested to know, not only MSNBC, but also Fox. <laughs> so she's clearly credible as someone who is not just preaching to the choir. So I, I am hope you'll have a chance to speak with these students. I think they are carrying on work in a way that would have thrilled David. Thanks. It is now my pleasure to um, introduce um, our speaker. Um, many of you know him from the recent, um, the recent publicity on his um, latest work, um, but I've um, known his work for decades, for the same amount of time I've known about David Gordon's work. Um, he did his undergraduate, Robert J. Gordon um, did his undergraduate work at Harvard, and then he attended Oxford University in England on a Marshall Scholarship. He received his Ph.D. in 1967 at MIT and taught at Harvard and the University of Chicago before arriving and where he teaches now at Northwestern University in 1973. He's taught there more than 35 years, and he was the chair of the Department of Economics from 1992 to 1996. Professor Gord is one of, is one of the world's leading experts on inflation, unemployment, productivity growth, and income inequality. His recent work on the fall and rise of the new economy, the U.S. productivity growth revival, and the recent stalling of European productivity growth, and the widening of U.S. income inequality has been widely cited. He is the author of The Measurement of Durable Goods Prices, which has become known as the definitive work showing that government price indices substantially overstate the rate of inflation. Gordon is a research associate of many um, prominent um, centers of Economic Research, namely the National Bureau of Economic Research. In addition, he is the Guggenheim Fellow, a Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and a Fellow of the Econometric Society. He serves currently on the Economic Advisory Panels of the Congressional Budget Office and the Bureau of Economic Analysis. He has served as a member of the Quadrennial Technical Panel on Assumptions and Methods of the Social Security Administration, and on the famous um, Boston Commission, which assessed the accuracy of U.S. Um, consumer price indices. Um, Robert Gordon lives in Evanston, Illinois, where Northwestern University is. He lives with his wife, Ju Julie, and your two dogs, Lucky and Toto. <laughs> Thanks very much. Uh, <clears throat> delighted to be here, obviously. and. I noticed that somebody has control of the lights and is capable of getting this uh, light off the screen so that everybody uh, can see it a little better. Uh, and I want to uh, give a hint to the cameraman. You want to keep your camera on the screen because this goes really fast. Uh, let me start. Can we point the microphone at the and turn the, yeah, mic, the mic a little bit? And the lights, oh, you, you, you want some jam. Oh. Yeah. You don't have a lapel mic. No, no. okay. Okay, so a little bit of <clears throat> bi mutual biography. Um, I was born in 1940. David was born in 1944. I, s I hated sports and athletics. David was an all-around champ. Uh, in fact, he was a star at discus throwing in high school. Uh, he was always three years, eight months behind in chronology, but mu much closer in mental age. Uh, and would you believe, as two brothers, between 1955 and 1957, we had all top 40 
hit records, and every week we would have to replace the dying ones with the new ones. I cannot believe we could have had that much money to spend. Maybe it was just the top ten after all. And as already mentioned, I went to Harvard and so did he, and we were three classes uh, apart. Now, this is a talk that covers a lot of ground. Uh, I'm going to give you a very ca encapsulized version of my is economic growth in the United States over question mark. Uh, I'm going to spend the middle third um, providing you some sort of uh, connections between my thinking and David's creative and revolutionary 1996 book, Fat and Mean, um, which was his last book. And then in the last third, I'm going to focus on the advertised title, uh, trying to make sense of uh, rising inequality and what to do about it, uh, combining his ideas, my ideas, and ideas that neither of us have really uh, grappled with. So the uh, big controversy arose from uh, my NBR working paper a little more than a year ago called Is Economic Growth Over? A uh, subtitle was Faltering Innovation and the Six Headwinds. The startling prediction was that after growing at 2.0% for the 120 roughly years between 1890 and 2007, the future holds a much dimmer uh, prediction. That the disposable income, carefully qualified disposable income of the bottom 99% of the income distribution will grow at only 0 0.2. And that contrast, the audacity uh, to contrast 2.0 with 0 0.2 is what gets people really upset. Um, now, almost all the criticism was directed at the faltering innovation part of the title. And it's my fault that I put faltering innovation in the title in that way, as if I were predicting that all of innovation for the rest of history is going to stop tomorrow on October 26th. Um, most of the commentators ignored the, the headwinds because they were so uncontroversial. Uh, and in fact, David has written about uh, a number of those headwinds, not only in his uh, last book, but in uh, many other places as well. Now to see what's been happening to the U.S. economy and to connect some of these ideas with facts, we need to distinguish between growth in the standard of living, which is conventionally measured by total GDP or output per person. Uh, economists, for arcane reasons, always abbreviate uh, GDP as capital Y, uh, divided by N, the number of people. Productivity has the same numerator, uh, but it's total output per hour, so the denominator is different. It's total aggregate hours measured in hundreds of billions. Uh, and the identity at the bottom with th a three bar equal sign, because it's got to be true, uh, is that output ca per capita and per hour grow at the same rate unless there are changes in hours per uh, capita. Uh, David actually makes quite a few comments about hours per capita, and I may uh, briefly refer to those uh, in a little bit. Now, this is a graph that has growth rates on the vertical. They could be either positive or negative. Uh, and I think somewhat uniquely, this bar graph shows the length of each interval as the width of the bar. So long intervals have fat bars, and short intervals have little tiny bars. And the first interval is the really important one. It's um, 1891 to 1972. Uh, there we had productivity growth shown in green of 2.3, uh, income per capita growth a little bit slower at 2.1, and the difference was minus 0 0.2, a decline in hours per capita, which is completely normal. As a society becomes more prosperous, uh, people choose to take longer vacations, and we had a big transition during that period from the 60-hour work week, especially in manufacturing, <coughs> to more like 40 hours. Then we had the period of the productivity slowdown, uh, 1972 to 1996, and so David did not live to see the last two periods, which are the short periods uh, starting in 1996 and then the last one in 2004. And you'll see all three of those right-hand eras were quite different. Um, in the third, in the second one, starting in 1972, notice that hours per capita, the gray bar, uh, becomes positive. That's when the women were coming into the labor force, allowing the red bar to be higher than the green bar. That is, we had a big slowdown in productivity growth, but it was somewhat buffered for income per capita because hours were rising. But that could not last forever once the women who wanted to come to work were in the labor force. In the heyday of the dot-com computer revolution, we had an enormous revival in productivity growth uh, so that that third green bar is even higher than the big fat one over on the left. 
But hours per capita started dropping. And as a result, income per capita didn't keep up with productivity. And then we've had the calamitous last eight years, and we can now update this to 2013. It's been nine years in which we've got hours per capita are shrinking at a full one point per year, meaning that our very slow productivity growth has yielded almost no growth in income per capita for the past uh, nine years. And as we will see, income per capita is still below where it was in 2007. Uh, if you average those last two periods, hours per capita declined at about three quarters of a percentage point uh, for the last 16 going on uh, 17 years. Part of that, of course, is due to the rise in unemployment. Unemployment in 04 was about the same as in 1996. Uh, it's higher now. Um, if you adjust for that, you still have a decline of about minus 0.6 in hours per capita, and that is one of the big headwinds. Uh, it, going out in the future, I assume it's going to drop at 0.4, not at 0.6. I think some of this um, calamitous decline in labor force pr uh, participation uh, is going to come to an end. Uh, nobody knows when. Uh, in addition to demographics wrapped up in this hours per capita figure, the second headwind is education. A big source of that huge amount of productivity growth that we had in the 20th century was from a starting point at which only in 1900 10 percent of people finished high school and only 3 percent finished college. That 10 percent high school uh, went up to close to 80 percent by um, 1975. We're somewhat below that now if you follow Jim Heckman of the University of Chicago who does not believe that GED uh, certi certificates should count in high school graduation because GED earners uh, have the same socioeconomic uh, outcomes as high school dropouts. Uh, we have a lot of people going to community colleges, a very small percentage of them finish. Uh, the U.S. is the only developed country uh, where the educational attainment of those aged 55 to 64 is the same as 25 to 34. In other words, we have, we've skipped a whole generation without a net improvement in educational attainment, the well-known conclusion of Claudia Golden and Larry Katz. Uh, as a result, the U.S. has dropped from number one to number 16 among the developed countries in college completion rates. Uh, and most of the people who try to quantify this and its effect on growth follow Harvard's Dale Jorgensen in saying that this educational stagnation is going to cut about 0.3 off our future growth, and that's the number that I'll use. The third headwind is why we're here tonight uh, to talk about inequality. Uh, way back in the Clinton first presidential com campaign in 1992, uh, Paul Krugman dug through an obscure government document and figured out that the top 1% had achieved almost all of the gains in income in the previous uh, 15 years, and that, of course, is now a uh, commonplace. If we look at the data from Piketty and Saez, which were not available uh, to David, uh, we have a sharply U-shaped curve uh, going back to 1913 in the income share of the top 1%. So it starts high, it goes way down, You'll see the chart in a minute and comes way back up. But if you look at 1913 to 2013, there's hardly any difference. So inequality doesn't play a role in uh, achieving that 2.0 historical rate. That was true not only of the average, but also of the bottom 99%. Whereas in contrast, over the last two decades, we're going back up in the share of the top 1%. And what that comes out to in the best data we've got is that the growth rate of incomes in the bottom 99% is half a point per year slower than for the average. And we're going to have to knock that off as one of the headwinds. Here's the graph. Focus on a lot of countries are in here uh, showing that we don't have the big rise in inequality in France and Japan that we do uh, in Canada and the U.S. And the U.S. is the champion of growing inequality. Just focus on the dark blue line and notice the U-shape. 8% back in 1929, down to 2% for most of the first half of the post-war, and then shooting back up close to 8%. That's the income share of the top 1% of the population. So that's the inequality story. The final headwind I'm going to talk about, I'm only talking about four of the six headwinds, uh, is the problem imposed by future growth in the federal debt. This is uh, the Congressional Budget <coughs> Office uh, going out to 2038, uh, and uh, 
we seem to have a little hiatus with no problem until about 2020, and then we have a big increase in the projected debt to GDP ratio. I think all of this is too optimistic because the uh, CBO's projections of future GDP growth are too optimistic. But at some point, whether it's 10 years from now or five years from now, we have to have some combination of higher taxes and some adjustment of entitlements uh, to keep that ratio from growing forever. Uh, and in my language, when we go from total real income to disposable real income, I, I take another point two off for the inevitability of either higher taxes, uh, slower growth of benefits, or a combination of the two in the future. So here's the exercise and subtraction. We start from a historical 2.0 growth in income per capita, take off 0.2 for demographics, 0.3 for education, 0.5 for inequality, 0.2 for fixing the debt, uh, and that brings us down to 0 0.8. How are we doing now compared to either history or this pessimism? Well, here's a green line that goes all the way from 1891, shoots through 2007, goes out into the future at 2%. Then I have a black line going out at 0 0.8, which is the implication of the above. Uh, and then red is where we are now. So our income per capita, as you see, is almost now back to where it was in 2007. But we've lost now uh, about six years of growth. Uh, just to remind you now, we started from this. We've already talked about this. Let's now focus in on the green bars. Just look at productivity because we want to figure out what's happening uh, to innovation. If I take the early period, 1891 to 1972, and then I average together the past three periods <coughs> and go over the last 40 years, here's what we have. And for me, this is the best possible summary of the importance of the second industrial revolution, all those things invented in the late 19th century, versus the third industrial revolution, which is everything the computer has given us and digitalization have given us since uh, 1972. Uh, the reason the second industrial revolution was so important was it was five-dimensional at least, and you can come up with more than five dimensions. We have electricity, motor vehicles, running water and sewers. The greatest event in the history of female liberation, by the way, was running water. Uh, famous, I mean, quote, I cannot resist telling every audience, the average North Carolina farm housewife in 1885 uh, walked 148 miles a year carrying 35 tons of water, and all the water that was carried into the house had to be carried out. Um, we had the revolution in information, communication, and entertainment. And something that most people don't count, but should, is the huge improvement in working conditions. In the book I'm writing, it would just curl your hair to, to look at the working conditions of steel workers in 1900, when the work week was 72 hours and all the work was hot, hot dirty, and dangerous. So it was the number of dimensions of the Second Industrial Revolution that made such a difference. And we got the final spin-offs of the Second Industrial Revolution in the early post-war years with air conditioning, commercial air transport, and the interstate highway system. In contrast, computers, the ICT revolution, has been one dimension. Very important, as we'll see, but just one dimension. I'm not going to explain where I got this. It will take too much time, but I'm going to take 0.6 off uh, our future economic growth for the slowdown in innovation that already happened uh, 40 years ago. And here in bars are the root from 2.0 down to 0 0.2, with the final transition being the guesstimate that we're going to have uh, innovation that's about 0.6 slower uh, in the future. Now, this is an amazingly optimistic prediction, believe it or not, because think of all that's been invented in the next 40 years, and I'm suggesting we're going to invent just as much stuff in the next 40 as we have in the last 40. Uh, let me just rattle this off. We've invented the PC, the internet, web browsing, e-commerce, mobile phones, digital music, smartphones, iPads, digitalization of library catalogs, parts catalogs, barcode scanning, the ATM machine, iTunes, cable TV, movie streaming. We've invented all that stuff. Are we really inventing new stuff every year, 2012, 2013, 2014? Uh, that matches that achievement. I'm very skeptical, but I don't need to be skeptical because uh, innovation can continue at the rate of the last 40 years. It's fine with me. So here is the future. Uh, you know, you could go about 70 years or 20 years. The, the time frame is uh, vague, deliberately vague. 
So we're not going to have an end of productivity growth. It's going to go down from 2.2 to 1.3. We're not going to have an end of growth in income per capita. What we are going to have is an end of growth in disposable income for the bottom 99%. And that's why inequality is deep at the heart of this entire uh, discussion. Now, I've le left out a lot of other things to be pessimistic about. Just to cheer you up, I've left them out. Uh, I've left out Charles Murray's social collapse in Fishtown. That is, the bottom one-third of the white population is developing characteristics that are much like the, uh, those uh, portrayed in the Moynihan Report of 50 years ago. Uh, key statistic, the percent of children of women aged 40 in the bottom one-third of the white population who live with both biological parents went from 95% in 1960 to 38% in 2010. There's no better predictor of high school dropouts than children growing up with one parent. Uh, the Amer American medical care system uh, compared to the Canadian percentage of GDP wastes about a trillion dollars a year and our life expectancy in league tables is number 38 compared to Canada's number four. Uh, a very new problem uh, just exploding in the last decade are mountains of student debt that are fundamentally changing the life options for 20 and 30 years ago. And all of this is totally unnecessary. Look at other countries and in particular look north not only at the Canadian medical care system. Go look up the rate of college tuition at the University of Toronto for Canadian residents. Last year, it was $5,600 a year, not 40000 not 45000 Now it's time to talk about David's book. It is strikingly original, and it combines three themes. First, the fat part of fat and mean is that American corporations are extremely overstaffed with managers compared to Japan and the leading European countries. Uh, David calls it bureaucratic bloat, and I'll uh, abbreviate it BB, because bureaucratic bloat is quite a mouthful to get out. Um, the corporations are mean. Uh, they've held down the wages of production workers, uh, and they've done so with the big stick the method by which the large corporations are driving down real wages. Uh, the big stick contrasts to the carrot approach, uh, which David also uh, uses two other words to contrast the U.S. and other uh, types of management, coercion compared to cooperation. Now, the first thing to say about the three hypotheses is that they are logically independent. You could have each one of them be true without the other one being true. Uh, I was talking to David uh, coming over uh, David and I are pretty skeptical about bureaucratic bloat, but you could still have the big stick and you could still have real wage stagnation. And so uh, the basic themes of the book could still survive, uh, even if we uh, didn't have bureaucratic uh, bloat. Uh, the book is extremely persuasive. If you come to the book ignor ignorant of BB or believing that stagnant real wages are due to something other than the big stick, the arguments in the book are so strong they will wrestle you to the ground. And I know, I've read this whole book uh, in the past week. Um, and the range of evidence that he brings to support uh, his views are so wide-ranging, from academic journal papers, business-oriented journalism, international comparison studies, and he, with his own team, had lots of interviews with workers with very persuasive anecdotes of abusive management attitudes. Now, I was interested in getting an outside assessment of a couple of aspects of David's uh, book. And so I turned to Nick Bloom, who probably a, a number of you have not heard of, but he's at Stanford, and he's the co-author of the NBER's Productivity and Innovation Research Program. And the reason he's important is that he and an English economist have done very intensive micro-studies of how American-owned companies perform in England and France compared to locally-owned companies. And I'll come back to that in a minute. But Nick says of David, David's comments about managers enriching themselves at the expense of workers seems a very insightful take on the wave of rising inequality we've seen since the late 1980s, but only started to be noticed in the late 1990s. That's very few people spotted it that early. Uh, and so his work was far ahead of the curve uh, and foreshadowed the Occupy movement of 10 years later. Uh, in two ways, the book goes beyond suggesting that top-heavy corporations use the big stick to suppress wage increases. First, it spends a lot of time, indeed a whole chapter, denying the importance of conventional explanations of wage stagnation, especially skill bias, technical change, and globalization. And these, these arguments are enough to really sort of knock you off uh, your chair. 
because you know a lot of people deeply believe that those things matter. Uh, it also goes beyond wage stagnation to, to blame the big stick and the lack of jobs and slow wage growth for many social ills, from ri uh, ranging from rising divorce rates to teenage pregnancy to drug-related gang crime. Uh, and indeed, the book would be entirely intact if he had not made that stretch. And I do uh, uh, plan to come back to that in two slides right at, the, uh, right at the end. Despite the power of the argument, the reader is torn. Because even if the big stick and BB partially explain stagnant wages, there's got to be room left for some role of the conventional explanation, skills and globalization. Aren't complex problems often the result of multiple causes rather than of a single cause? Uh, and just to, to mention uh, one piece of evidence that uh, David could not have observed, uh, between 2001 and 2007, during the so-called economic expansion of the early 19, uh, the early decade of this uh, millennium, uh, the um, United States lost in the expansion three million manufacturing jobs. And this was the period of the maximum impact of the increase in imports from China and the soaring American trade deficit. And a lot of those factories that closed were put out of business by Chinese imports, and that's globalization. Uh, the other thing that, that concerns me is that large corporations, of course, are dominant in manufacturing and, and some other industries, but we've got a huge service sector in the United States. Seventy percent of GDP is in the services, and a lot of the jobs are being created by millions of small businesses. And those millions of small businesses, it's sort of hard to apply the big stick to a mom pa restaurant uh, with 10 employees. But still, there is a growing consensus that supports David's view. Um, and it comes down to using uh, language I associate with Alan Sinai, uh, a switch from maximizing stakeholder value, that is, equal emphasis on shareholders, employees, and customers, to a single-minded emphasis on maximizing uh, shareholder value. David quotes from Robert Reich, the social contract is no longer with us. Uh, and this was happening right as David was, was writing in the mid-1990s, which was the key period in which we had a massive switch in corporate CEO and executive compensation towards stock options, which in the income distribution uh, statistics are counted as labor income and do account for a lot of that rise in the top 1%. Uh, the business press concurs with David. There are two types of companies in the United States. There are carrot companies, not just stick companies. David uses examples of two steel companies that have enlightened policies, Nucor and Magna. The business press is constantly telling us about Costco taking the high road with high wages, stability, and good benefits, and Walmart taking the low road. Despite Whole Foods' whole paycheck yeah. price tag, uh, the high pricing does partly spill over to unusually good working conditions and benefits for its employers and em, uh, employees. Uh, I'm in the unusual situation of living halfway between two different Whole Foods that are each half a mile from my house. And I can attest to you, there is incredible job stability. Those people have been working at that store um, ever since it's, it opened 15 years ago. It's an admirable place for employees. Forget the... the, the prices to the customer. At the opposite, the poster child of the big stick is Caterpillar Tractor, and there are plenty of other companies like that. It's willing to take strikes, as it has twice in the last three years, to impose lower wages, cuts in benefits, higher employee contributions. Uh, it reported, oh, we're so sad for Caterpillar, its sales went down from 66 to 55 billion in the last year. When will its CEO reduce his own $20 million annual paycheck? Now, Nick Bloom had some comments about the big stick. It is true U.S. firms are more aggressive in pay and promotions. That is more strongly merit-based. I would call that meritocratic, but you could also call it the big stick. And this nice juxtaposition, uh, he says in France, if you're good, it'll take you 10 years to be promoted. If you're bad, you'll stay. Whereas in the United States, if you're good, it'll take you three years to be promoted. And if you're bad, you better clean up your act or you're going to be out of here. Uh, so uh, that is something that he has noticed in his own research on management. But notice that that quote is actually about 
how managers within a firm are treated, not how managers as a whole are treating the workers, which is what David uh, is writing about. Um, the Nick Bloom, John Van Rienen research comes up with striking evidence that U.S. firms in England and France do better than locally owned firms, English and French owned firms. Um, for example, American managers work about a third more hours per year than the French. On this basis, I don't think they are bloated, and I've never heard anecdotally or seen any evidence claiming they have too many managers. Visiting U.S. factories, they are strikingly efficient, so if anything, they have too few managers. But of course, this doesn't deny the big stick. This is only about to the extent to which we have bureaucratic bloat. David is right up to an ex uh, a point about Europe, at least Northern Europe. Union strength has been preserved while unions have been evaporating uh, in the U.S. Germany has thrived with the cooperative model with at least two union members on every board of directors. But remember that 10 years ago under Schroeder, the German unions agreed to a nationwide program of wage moderation, a sort of nationwide agreement that wages are going to be held down for the good of the economy, something that's really hard to imagine. Uh, a centralized agreement like that in the U.S. context. The European model depends on climate. It has worked well in Sweden, the other Nordic countries, Germany and Austria. It has not worked well in France, Italy, Spain, Portugal, and Greece. And unions have created economic sclerosis in France. In Italy, there's been hardly any productivity growth at all in the last uh, 15 years. Now, here's another strength of David's argument. Uh, Chapter 6 is devoted to showing that productivity growth has been faster in the cooperative countries than in the coercive countries. But the tables turned after 1995. Uh, and so I, just to update you on what's happened to productivity uh, in Europe versus the U.S. The green line is the ratio of output per capita in the EU 15, the original members of the common market, including all five of the big Western European countries. Uh, the yellow line is output per hour. You see that Europe had fast productivity growth, almost caught up to the U.S. in 1995. That peak was written, probably th was reached probably the day David's book was published. And then it's been downhill ever since. So that's the level of Europe versus the U.S. When you convert those into growth rates, you get a growth rate of productivity for the EU 15 that looks like the blue line. The United States had this remarkable but short-lived productivity revival in the late 1990s. But ever since, uh, European productivity growth has been at best half that uh, in the U.S. Europe didn't switch from carrots to sticks. The U.S. didn't switch from sticks to carrots. Uh, in fact, it was a completely different set of factors. And just to make this a, a very short story, uh, most of the people who studied this um, have concluded that the real heart of the problem in Europe is in wholesale and retail and part of that is land use planning, and half of it is the pedestrian districts in the historic cities uh, that are just very inefficient uh, to supply uh, and maintain. Now, what about increased inequality? We're now in the last part of the, the three parts. There are two parts to the story, the top 1% and the bottom 90%. And my diagnosis for the bottom 90% overlaps with David's partially. Uh, first on his list, is the decline in the real minimum wage. That's always been on my list. Second, reduced union presence, power, penetration. Certainly on both lists, David puts a lot of emphasis on that. Uh, my list includes globalization, both in the form of offshoring, sending plants to Mexico, and buying a lot of Chinese imports. Uh, David and I both put uh, m only minor emphasis on low-skilled immigration. Uh, that that form of globalization does not seem to have done uh, much harm. Inequality at the, at the top, how come? I divide it up into three pieces of the top 1%. First is the economics of superstars, the Oprahs, Alex Rodriguez, and these incredible <coughs> salaries that now are paid to athletes and uh, entertainment <laughs> stars. A lot of that is due to the worldwide coverage of Hollywood movies and in particular the rise of cable television that has put every football game, college and pro, on the air all the time and the enormous advertising revenue is spilled down into beyond the team owners into the players. The second big thing going on in the top 1% are the huge financial rewards that enrich those people on Wall Street who gave us the Great Recession. Uh, and many people, including me, think that 
our national statistics are really screwed up, that these people aren't really contributing anything to GDP. Uh, they're earning pure rents, uh, and that uh, real, real value added in the financial sector is hugely overstated. And then finally, during this period, corporate compensation went from 40 times the average wage to 400 times, as I mentioned before, fueled by stock options. And this is just to remind us that the top 1% were, were gaining throughout this period that began in the late 1970s. David has five solutions. I've got a, just a very brief comment on some of them. Raise the minimum wage, ease the path to unions, make contingent employment less attractive to employers, four, establish an investment bank to reward good firms, and five, improve education and training. Comments, I agree about the minimum wage despite universal economics 101 that says it'll cause unemployment. I think it's worth taking that risk. The amount of unemployment it might cause is highly uncertain, and I think boosting the minimum wage to put a floor on poverty incomes is worth that gamble. Uh, I'll, I'll have a comment about unions uh, on the next slide and on contingent employment. Uh, my problem with the fourth proposition about an investment bank is it would be very hard uh, to choose which firms were good and to come up with criteria that could be applied in, impartially. And then improve education and training. Everybody agrees about that. The big question is how. Well, what about unions? I was seven years old when the Taft-Hartley Act passed, and I learned from my mom and my dad that it was the worst thing that had happened in the United States since the outbreak of World War II. Um, and indeed, such has come true. By having half the states right-to-work states where it's very difficult to organize unions, as a result, all, with one or two exceptions, all foreign auto plants have been opened in the right-to-work or southern states. The bankruptcy of Detroit is indirectly due to the Taft-Hartley law that drove auto manufacturing out of the north. Uh, as of 10 years ago, before the bankruptcies, uh, both GM and Chrysler and Ford uh, had costs of about 1500 1400 1500 per car of excess costs due to legacy uh, medical care and pensions for their retirees. And this brings us back to the medical care system. If you have medical care as a right of citizenship, paid for by taxes, especially a value-added tax that you can't escape, as in Canada, uh, you don't have to saddle individual firms with pension costs related to medical care. My problem with unions has not been that they uh, prop up wages for medium-skilled people. It's been the feather bedding, uh, requiring firemen on locomotives long after there were no fires. Uh, and things like that. Three pilots when two uh, would be enough. Uh, my biggest problem with uh, David's book is the, is the chapter five, that the big stick is responsible for all of society's ills. Um, and I want to talk about black youth crime, and I'm going to relate this right down to the present because there is a very important editorial in the Sh Chicago Tribune from last Sunday uh, that I think puts together some of the things that, that I feel about this topic. Um, he, David does not comment that outcomes economically for black women and black men have been completely different. Black women have made amazing progress in catching up to the wages <coughs> and, and occupational distribution of white women, but the black men have not. And let's all agree about the first reason. David would be, would be right here, uh, and Denny would too, that blacks are disproportionately sent to prison for drug offenses. That a black and a white doing the same kind of thing with drugs, the, the blacks are maybe 10 times more likely to be sent to prison and with all the horrible social consequences uh, that go with that. But black male youth crime goes way beyond drug possession and contributes to poverty. There is no greater cause of poverty in the black community than high crime rates. Um, and uh, we see this in Detroit, where long ago the black middle class fled uh, the city limits. It's in process right now in Chicago, happening the same way. 91% of murder victims uh, in Chicago are black people who are killed by other black people. Uh, David emphasizes too much that jobs are created by big corporations. But the heart and soul of any city is the locally owned businesses, which thrive or die depending on the behavior of the local population. And here's what I want to read you as my final words. Uh, Chicago Tribune last Sunday, a scorching jobs desert. 
It has a diagram of one city block in Chicago with, in red, all the crimes that have occurred in that one block over the last year. Lack of opportunity dominates 79th and Halstead. Vacant lots and empty storefronts surround scrappy survivors like the Jerk Chicken Restaurant, which is the sort of subject of this editorial. This could be a promising area. The street is busy, the sidewalks active with foot traffic, potential customers abound. Unfortunately, so do criminals. In recent weeks, thieves broke in to the apartments upstairs from Jamaican Jerk Villa, the name of the restaurant, twice in one week. At the liquor store across the street, an assault with a dangerous weapon. At the corner, an aggravated assault with handguns one day and a strong arm robbery the next. What's more, those who like Mr. McKnight, who owns the jerk chicken restaurant, will hire local employees from a workforce unprepared for work. Everybody wants a job until you give them one, he says. And I'm just speaking for the owner of the small business. Uh, a final anecdote from that article, Walmart, which has uh, sort of led the way, despite being the bad guy versus Costco, they have led the way in, in opening big superstores in the south and west sides of uh, Chicago. Uh, and they find such employee unreliability that in the weeks after people get their income tax refunds, employees stop showing up because suddenly they have enough short-term cash uh, to get through the next week or two. So it's not just big corporations that are causing uh, these problems. It's deep, it's complex, uh, and the solutions are hard to find. And I congratulate New York City for whatever they've done to wind up with a murder rate that's one quarter uh, that of Chicago. But I might add, uh, Chicago's not in the top 10 uh, of the worst cities. Um, Detroit and New Orleans uh, have far worse rates. So here are some policy solutions, and this is my last slide. David will be glad to hear. Uh, the David Howell. Um, I mentioned the dysfunctional US medical care system. It's part of driving down wages. It's part of pushing workers into part-time, involuntary part-time jobs. Make medical care a right of citizenship. Obamacare failed to make a dent in that deep flaw in American society. Immigration, I think it's the best possible cure to the growing dependency rate, the, the increased burden of Social Security, the shrinking number of working people. Uh, let the immigrants come in. From 1865 to 1913, there were no passports, but we had a prosperous and dynamic economy. And as I look at New York versus Chicago, I think the single biggest reason for New York City's success in the last 20 years is its attraction to immigrants from all over the world. Uh, and it is a very dynamic place as a result. And finally, I am absolutely adamant about legalizing drugs. If drugs had been legal since 1975, millions of young black men would have escaped the lifelong stigma of a criminal record, and the U.S. would have saved cumulatively $1 trillion. It's all in Milton Friedman's Capitalism and Freedom, written more than 50 years ago, the enormous benefits of legalizing drugs and the futility of trying to stop them. If we had marijuana packs in every 7-Eleven in colorful packages, the government collecting the tax revenue legally, and nobody left to be in prison, that would have been a far better world. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you, Teresa uh, and SIPA and the New School and Bob Gordon for coming and um, uh, presenting this talk. Um, to us, and also to be up here with uh, Anwar Sheikh, um, who was also, like David, a teacher of mine back in 1976. Mm -hmm. So um, it comes rarely these days, but um, that makes me feel young. <laughs> so <laughs> stay with it. Now, um, yeah, I should talk into the mic. Um, so uh, I've been told it's a strict 12 minutes. Um, I was going to uh, do some reminiscences and appreciation, but I'm going to cut that really short. Then I'm going to talk about uh, fat and mean um, and basically leave it to um, Bob's summary. I, I think he did a good job of that. Uh, the third is I'm going to make some comments, raise some questions about uh, Bob's growth pessimism. 
And the fourth, uh, I'll talk a bit about Gordon on Gordon uh, and uh, take him to task a little bit on France, uh, or I'm going to try to. Will you do it in French or in English? Uh, <laughs> I wish I could do it in French. My wife is smiling here. Uh, all right, well, reminisces. Um, I, you know, just to set the context, and since not all of you know me, uh, I came to the school in 1975, and David had just started the year before. Uh, and I came unmatriculated with a politics and philosophy background from NYU. No economics, um, but uh, thankfully the new school took me anyway. Uh, I did uh, well in the first year, and especially in David's courses, and um, they were just a revelation to me and to, I think, a lot of you who, uh, I've seen a number of you here who took his courses. Um, uh, but I, I wasn't going to stay in economics. I had no um, interest in being a PhD economist. Uh, um, and in fact, I'd been working at Paragon, and my idea was to be a small business person and compete with Paragon and actually um, sell backpacking equipment. But David called me in the summer of 1976 and invited me to be part of the Labor Institute. Um, the Institute for Labor Education and Research. And uh, along with Ron Blackwell, who was just until recently, um, who was actually my student advisor and was the uh, uh, um, uh, advisor uh, to um, the head of the AFL-CIO. I mean, he's been a, had a fantastic career, along with a number of other people in our, in our class and around those classes. So anyway, I stuck it out and I, I got my degree here and did a few years at, uh, with Leontief at NYU and then came back and, and I'm very thankful that the new school was good enough to hire me in 1985. And that meant that I was a colleague of David's from 1985 to 1996 and a very close one. So I had the um, privilege to be his um, student, his employee, and uh, his colleague. And uh, I just want to say that he, uh, he was uh, an incredibly generous um, uh, teacher and, I don't know about employer, but uh, and colleague as well. Big stick. <laughs> yeah, big stick. And, uh, you know, not, nonprofits are, are run on a shoestring. Um, uh, so uh, I just want to say, um, for all the students who had David, how important he was, and uh, just as a note of appreciation. So, uh, and that gives you a little context about where, where I am, but this won't move. Oh, wrong one. Okay, so um, my second piece of this 12 minutes, and I'm way over already, is um, about fat and mean. And I think I, I agree with Bob. I, when he was writing it, I didn't really buy it. Um, the bureaucratic bloat, um, there is bureaucratic bloat in a lot of organizations. Uh, unfortunately, um, some of those are academic institutions. I'm not going to say anything about the new school, the ratio of administrators to faculty and how that's changed over time, but maybe Bob could talk about Northwestern. Uh, I just don't think that qu quantitatively that's um, been a, a big deal in terms of the growth of inequality and the use of the big stick. I think that it was particularly in, uh, unfortunate for David to have focused on this, to put it in the title and to put it as the first chapter. I think this is, I agree with Bob, this is a great book. It should have had a huge impact and it didn't have as big an impact as it could have because I think like people who were focused on Bob's title on, on innovation, you know, how you package your stuff, students, is really, really important. And um, I don't think people picked up on the, the the BB part, and um, and that that hurt his uh, 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 um, the influence that that book had, and 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 it should have had much more. Rather, he was right about this: that there was an idea, huge ideological shift to free market fundamentalism back in the late 70s, uh, and that meant deregulation and a reordering of social norms. Uh, and that in turn meant that there was a collapse in worker bargaining power and a surge in CEO bargaining power. And I think, um, again, Bob has this just right. And it appears uh, in other places, but um, not many other places uh, for the f um, in, in David's book and 
published in 1996. Um, so uh, what he got right was this basic political economy story. Uh, and, and that was written in the early 90s um, by David. And um, I've, I'm, I've been working the last eight months on a big project for the Center for American Progress, that's CAP. And I find myself basically um, uh, presenting the same story. Uh, and this is an alternative story, a and I call it a political economy story, to um, the, what I call the laissez-faire story, following uh, Richard Freeman's um, uh, uh, label for the post-1980 period as the laissez-faire experiment. And that's actually the part of the title of this CAP report. But I found myself basically telling a story that uh, David and only a few others were telling in the early 90s. David was also right about some, some really important facts. And I'm going to uh, point out two of them here. These, are, um, these figures are the figures that are in the report. David is writing in here. And so you can see that the 1% the skyrocketed just as he was um, very ill. And this is another miracle that he was able to do this. Uh, writing this book, um, given how he was doing. Uh, but he saw this, and uh, there's also this decline in the middle class share. Uh, and, but just he would have been just terrified to have seen what happened after 1996, because it's you know, two-thirds of the, the worsening, uh, if you don't like these trends, took place after the book was published. Um, his story about the big stick is encapsulated, I think, summarized in this graph, which many of you have seen. But the key thing is the productivity growth skyrocketing. This is manufacturing. Um, uh, four, these, these are off. I'm afraid that trans putting it in the PowerPoint screwed this up. But um, this dotted line is production worker um, compensation. It's not just wages. It's everything. 4% from 1980, cumulative. Uh, anyway, uh, I'm going to keep going. There's also uh, support for David's vision of um, cross-country economic performance. Bob alluded to this, conflictual versus cooperative economies. This is also in the report. Well, here you've got the, G the um, measure of inequality, and here you've got growth. And you've got the high inequality countries of Spain and Italy up there with the uh, laissez-faire countries of the U.S. and U.K., but way down here are the low inequality countries of Germany and Austria and Finland and Sweden. And um, if you include these outliers, and for various reasons that you might throw these out, Ireland and Korea, you've got a downward slope. The regression line looks that, like this. But it's really a strongly negative relationship if you throw these guys out. Um, so it turns out that you can have very low inequality and high growth. I mean, they did better than the laissez-faire countries over this period. Uh, this is what David was saying. He didn't have quite these data, but um, I think this supports his view. Uh, now, uh, moving to part three, um, Bob's growth pessimism. Um, uh, here are a couple of questions. Let, uh, let's say growth continues on its recent slow path. My question is, uh, I've, I've been with the help of uh, one of our students, Bert Azazogl, struggling through what GDP actually means and how it's measured. One of the things David taught us, be careful about numbers and be know, and Leontief also, know what the numbers mean. Um, Vasily would always say, you, economists don't do, they don't roll up their sleeves and get into the data. Um, so my question is output of what, for what? I mean, how important is it that we have uh, more efficient Whole Foods and Walmarts as opposed to French towns that have, <laughs> okay. Uh, 40 kinds of cheese. Yeah, well, okay. Uh, there's a problem, a huge problem of measurement of GDP. It's really measured badly. And it's seven, Bob says 70, I thought it was about 80% of GDP. Uh, what about the translation into quality of life? And most importantly, why do we care about growth anyway? It's, if it's not shared, and it hasn't been, with the bottom 93% in the last decade and a half, why do we care about growth? 
I mean, it's, isn't it shared growth that matters? Um, I'm second, I'm skeptical about um, going out 20 and 30 years. Um, you know, we, with the exception of Dean Baker and Schiller, just won the Nobel Prize, basically no mainstream economists, well, Dean isn't a mainstream economist, but uh, saw this coming even a year before it happened. So um, what do economists have to say about 20 and 30 and 40 years from now? I have never been able to understand what business economists do in Wall Street for all the money that they make um, uh, because I don't think the predictions really work very well. The six headwinds, demographic, if we need more hours, we can encourage foreign born to come. We can raise the minimum wage. Um, Bob supports that. Uh, we can also do a better job with our hours, as Bob pointed out with uh, health care and Gordon pointed out over and over again with Bowles and Weisskopf. There's a lot of waste out there. Education, yes, but it's not a years of schooling or credentialing, it's college degree problem. It's skills, you know, and the recent OECD work shows that by, for every level of schooling, the U.S. does terribly relative to um, basically every other rich country. And it's gotten worse over the last 10 years. Inequality, this, according to Bob, this is the biggest deal. Um, yes, uh, he establishes, and everyone well knows that it's, uh, it's exploded, but um, I ask, and this is a big focus of my report, what are the mechanisms? In orthodox um, economics, it's about incentives to, to, to work and to invest and to risk, take risks. Uh, but I, there's an alternative um, political economy story. Energy and the environment, okay, I'm going to skip these. Uh, oh, I'm going to skip all three of them. You can see them, right? Okay. Uh, a lot of it has to do with World War II. I happen to be reading a World War II history, so I'm focused on that. Um, Gordon on Gordon, mostly I agree. And, um, I and my initial did I? Yeah, I'm sorry. I was racing in order to go pick you up, and I, it's my fault. My fault. Sorry. R, yeah. R, R J G. Sorry. Uh, and mostly I got it right. This one's wrong. Um, he's outraged uh, right at the end about um, this uh, uh, David's. Um, some statements David made in the book about black crime and maybe more generally his approach. Um, I am going to, I'm not going to deal with that. And maybe in the question and answer, um, Rick and others, Denny can talk about um, this issue. My outrage, I, I turn it back on, on Bob, um, and it has to do with the, the trashing of France that you get in the media and that I just saw in his, his slides. Um, uh, he argues that uh, labor unions and uh, employment protection laws have led to economic sclerosis in France and Italy. Well, in fact, there's zero evidence in cross-country studies, and there have been 10 or 12 really important ones, that EPL has any ability to explain employment or unemployment outcomes across country. So I'm just plugging um, my work with uh, Dean and, and Andrew Glynn and uh, John Schmidt um, on this. Um, but what about the productivity evidence? I don't think you can look at EU 15 very meaningfully. I don't think merging 15 countries together is very um, a good idea. Because the, as, he, as Bob points out in several of his papers, there are huge differences across countries. The dark line is the US. This is cumulative growth. The steepness of the line shows the productivity rate. Or you can just look at where it hits in 2007. Where is France? France is up, higher. Yeah, it's uh, it's time, but there's some good graphs coming. Just one minute. Uh, how about, that was per capita. How about um, um, real output per hour? Again, France, look up at the 2007 line. France is above the U.S. And the U.S. is in fifth place, in fact, below Sweden, below Germany. How about measurable output? And Duncan has been played a huge role in this, along with Nordhaus, Duncan more recently, and I've been um, following this up. Um, the U.S. is also the dark line. It's, it's right in the middle of the pack. Doesn't perform that well. What about levels of productivity? I'm almost done. Real productivity levels. France beats out the U.S. in 94, 2000, 2006. What about real measurable productivity? Basically, we're cutting out finance and the service sectors. No comparison. France and Germany are way above in each year, the U.S., which is the 100 line. Okay. Um, 
plus the food is really good and the lifestyle is really good. So, uh, what about cumulative manufacturing growth? This is the, basically the same thing as that graph, the diverging graph that I showed you. Uh, and that, that is the US, that's the one I showed you. But this is for all the others. The point of this one, though, is that we had all this productivity growth, 4% increase in median production worker compensation. That includes health care costs, which is not the worker's fault for having to pay more in health care costs. How much of manufacturing productivity growth was translated into compensation growth for production workers? 55% increase for Sweden. For France, 43%. In the US, 4%. You know, it's shared productivity that matters. Conclusion, I, f I agree with Bob on, on, on his assessment. I think we need, uh, of the book, I think we need to move, and David certainly argued for this in the book, towards a more social, cooperative, and, and, and regulated model, S perhaps Scandinavian, if not French. Uh, and what's really important is um, a shared growth, though, transformative technologies may also be important. Um, and I just want to say it's fantastic to see uh, how much uh, of a shared vision there is between RJG, sorry, and DMG. And I'm sure David is, is smiling at the kind of presentation he heard here today. Again, thanks to everyone for this. I decided, given the 12-minute limit, to forego PowerPoint, uh, and this means giving up one of my favorite graphs, which is about long waves from 1890 to the present. And uh, believe me, that's a major sacrifice. Uh, I want to talk about three aspects uh, of the discussion so far. One is uh, beginning with Bob's story about uh, growth and its uh, root in productivity growth. And I uh, then want to talk about um, the, the uh, relation of Bob's argument to David's argument about long waves. And that is an argument which hasn't come up yet, but it's a precursor of the fat and mean uh, book. And it's a very interesting argument, and I'm going to rely on it. Sorry, can you now hear me? No? Okay. And then... Uh, I'm going to talk about my own reading of the same issue and particularly of the potential uh, for growth in the United States. Let me start by commending Bob for uh, an excellent and illuminating talk and a, a, an amazing ability to get 52 slides into <laughs> 40 minutes. I, I, I would have bet that he couldn't do it, mm -hmm. but he did. Um, and I want to focus on the main theme which is the issue that economic growth is driven by technical change, particularly that type of technical change that revolutionizes industry. And Bob elsewhere talks about the technical revolution of steam and railroads from 18, uh, 1750 to 1830, the technical revolution uh, f then from 1870 to 1900, electricity, internal combustion engines, so on, so on. And the third technical revolution, in which he is, has less faith in terms of its ability to transform industry, which is computers, the web, uh, and uh, the mobile phones, and so on, from 1960 to the present. Now, he argues that in, the, in this third revolution has mostly run its course and in any way has less of an impact on industry, and that's one... Uh, reason for productivity growth uh, slowing down. And he also lists, as he did here, a, a variety of headwinds, which alas, I, I cannot talk in more detail about, but uh, David mentioned some of them. Uh, so the end result of Bob's argument is that we have, we're going to end up with much slower productivity growth if things continue the way they are in the US for the next 25 years, next quarter century. Uh, from a past growth of 2.2% from 1891 to 2007, we're going to end up with about 1.3% from 2000 forward to 2032. Uh, he also talks as a secondary feature about output per capita being different from productivity growth due to hours uh, worked per capita, and I'm going to have to <laughs> skip that, but uh, uh, David Howell mentioned that, and I, I, I generally agree with those arguments on both sides, actually. 
So what I want to pick up is the relationship between Bob's technical change argument and the and show that it has a remarkable connection to past arguments about long waves and about the generation of long waves. And here I want to cite just a few people, uh, Kondratiev, Schumpeter, David Gordon, uh, and that's all I have time for. Uh, <laughs> but there are many more, as you know. Let me start by Schumpeter's argument. Schumpeter, uh, and this is uh, actually very well summarized in a paper by David Gordon on uh, long waves, uh, uh, and it's his paper actually in a uh, um, book that he and I both had papers on long waves. And David mentions here that Schumpeter's argument is that births of technical innovation drive long upturns and then as they peter out, you get this slowdown in growth. So here you have technical innovation driving both the upturn and as it runs out of steam, it brings in the slowdown in growth. Kondratiev who was the originator of this, he and Trotsky are the two people who originated these ideas of long waves, and I have to leave Trotsky out, alas, here, says that the rhythm of long waves is related to the life cycle of long-lived fixed capital structures. So that the reason you have 30 or 40 year cycles or 45 year cycles is that structures uh, and of various sorts, plant and other structures, take that long to, to peter out. So any beginning of innovation, you have uh, these structures put in place, and as they, uh, their time comes, so to speak, then the uh, society slows down. And Kondratiev makes a very important point relative to what we're talking about now. He says, in a trough, when you're coming out of the trough into a boom, then previously shelf technology is adopted and new inventions are spurred, so that technical uh, innovation is a result of the boom, not the cause of the boom. It's a manifestation that conditions are better so people can put technology into play, and it also uh, stimulates new inventions. David, in his article called Social Structures of Accumulation uh, and Long Waves, uh, it's actually called the inside and outside the long swing, the endogeneity and exogeneity debate and the social structures of accumulation approach. David always liked long titles. <laughs> Um, and he says that growth is regulated by the interaction of four institutional relationships reflecting the re uh, affecting the relative power of capital to labor. And I'm citing him here. The capital-labor accord in which management gets to make decisions in labor in peace, in labor peace, so long as it provides, I quote, rising wages, benefits, and job security. That's number one. Secondly, Pax Americana which established general international stability and favorable terms for U.S. capital in dealing with foreign buyers and sellers. Number three, the Capital Citizen Accord, in which the priority of the capitalist pursuit of profit while meeting some basic citizen needs through government demand, management, public programs, and transfer. So these two are, are made uh, consistent by this Capital Citizen Accord. And lastly, the moderation of international capitalist rivalry, limiting foreign competition with U.S. firms. So where does David's argument lead if we look at the world today? We look at the world today and all of these four institutions have been uh, eliminated or smashed. And so we would not be surprised on his argument to find the conditions that we do find. Parenthetically, uh, on Bob's uh, data, uh, one of the implications of the long wave kind of argument that David was pursuing is that long waves by definition are variations in the rate of growth. And that means that you have to be very careful when you aggregate across time periods because if you don't aggregate across full waves, you'll have the bias of having a partial wave. And secondly, there is no a priori reason why full waves would have the same growth on the up and down turns. So you have to be careful about that. This is a common topic in the, in the long wave literature, which David also discussed. So with that in mind, I want to get to my own take on, on the possibilities of future U.S. growth. Um, and in, in by implication, the climate in Bob's terminology that U.S. could uh, achieve, whether it's a Swedish climate or a Spanish climate, would depend on what we do. I want to start by saying I've always argued the same thing, uh, which is that capitalist growth is regulated by profitability. 
because this is what drives business plans for expansion. Of course, it can be moderated by state spending and deficit spending, but this is the key driver. And here I cite the one person that in this room is generally taken with good uh, spirit. I don't know if Bob would agree to that, but at least uh, most of us, which is John Maynard Keynes, who says, the engine which drives enterprise is profit. And that is a point that uh, many economists have made. Secondly, international competition is driven by costs and quality differentials. In the modern era, countries like Malaysia and now China have combined extremely low wages with high productivity to produce at lower unit costs. Earlier, South Korea did the same, Japan did the same, so it's, no, it's not a new history. And unit labor costs, by the way, are the ratio of wages to productivity. So the issue is what determines this ratio of wages to productivity and international competitiveness. U.S. business is uh, international in scope and has been for a long time, and therefore for the U.S. to compete more efficiently, efficiently, unit labor costs must be lowered at a more rapid rate than they have been so far. Here, industrial policy to accelerate productivity growth provides greater room for real wage growth. This is what I call the Swedish example. We know that in the transformation of Sweden. They did it not by raising real wages, but raising productivity more than they raise real wages so that they can maintain a competitive advantage. An important point here, we know from this kinds of history, is that technical change is a social outcome. What Bob called climates, I call political climates, so perhaps they're not so different. So we see country after country, U.S. in the early days, Japan, South Korea, and China, uh, and many others in term. Okay, I'm close. <laughs> U.S. real wages have been under pressure from the collapse of the strength of unions and labor-friendly institutions from large, persistent, involuntary unemployment. I don't buy for a moment that the unemployment we have is natural in any sense, including a technical sense of relation to inflation and from the pressure of low foreign wages in, Af in Asia and Latin America. Industrial policy that raises productivity growth could provide more room for real wage growth while raising profitability. And this is key, it has to raise profitability also. And this is possible if the institutional structure is right. One of the key points which Bob made, I totally agree with them since my parents were Canadian citizens, my sister's a Canadian citizen, is that universal medical care is not only a good thing in itself, but it's extremely good for capital because it removes the cost, labor costs there. And they know that. And this is one reason the tide is moving, I think, shifting. A higher rate of profit does not imply, need not, it need not imply higher inequality if social policy changes the distribution of income which comes from property. And that's again a well-known thing that we can observe across different countries. At the core of my argument is that the state can, within limits, enhance productivity growth and real wage growth while also reducing the inequality of income. Notice that this is not a demand pumping argument. It is contrary, on the contrary, working from the profit side, i.e. the supply side in the classical sense, in which profit regulates both demand and supply, so that working from this linchpin is very crucial. And it, but it does not preclude the use of deficit based pump priming during a crisis, as many, many people argue. There are times, and Keynes himself argued, there are times when it is necessary. So at the heart of all such differences, the differences that we've expressed in this room is a point I always make at the end of every talk, that they're rooted in theoretical differences. These are not just our personal views, but also the theoretical views that we adopt and we utilize. And here, what's striking to me, at least, is that I seem to have more faith in the possibilities of U.S. capitalism than Bob Gordon. <laughs> but not faith in free market capitalism. That's a different story. Thank you. We now have, for the last two or three years, the highest share of corporate profits in GDP Thank you. Uh, in American history. The profits are there already. The growth is not coming from all these profits because the corporations are sitting on trillions of dollars of cash and not investing. And why is that? Because the economy is not growing fast enough. The accelerator, that is the dependence of investment on the rate of GDP growth, dominates the importance of cash flow as a determinant of investment. Otherwise, you can't explain the paradox. We've got a low ratio of investment to GDP and a historically high um, 
uh, rate of profit. And I think the huge amount of profits is part of the inequality uh, story. They, the CEOs can't pay each other fast enough, and some of it tumbles into the corporate treasury and it's just not being spent. So I think that is a fundamental uh, disagreement about where we stand right now. And that's about right now. That's not about the next 25 years. Can we all go around to, oh no, oh, how do you want to do this? Yeah, um, I really have two questions, but I'm only going to ask one given the limitation of time. The, the first one was just to hear a little bit more about uh, macroeconomics and the story, the, the nitty gritty of macroeconomics and especially about deflation and the measurement of um, the price level. But since we're thinking big, let me move to the bigger question. Um, which is, uh, do we really want to worry so much about productivity? Um, I mean, for, for centuries, the problems of humanity at large were that we didn't know how to produce what we needed in order to give ourselves as good a chance at a reasonable life as, as we can have, given the genetics. I, I wouldn't say that, I would say we're, certainly there's more to be done on that, but a, a lot of that has been done. And it seems to me, uh, echoing David's uh, uh, point, that uh, the crisis now is how do you get people incomes so that they can actually have access to what we already know how to produce? The, the question, <coughs> why do we need growth at all, has now come up twice. Once from you and once um, in one of the discussions. I forget which one. <coughs> David, um, rising productivity growth allows available income per person to increase subject to that qualification about hours per capita. Not to have growth turns us into a zero-sum society. Growth provides the resources to do things like preschool education without having to cut out anything else. No growth means if we want to do something that many of us think is worthwhile, like uh, preschool education, particularly for the bottom uh, half of the population, uh, we'd have to give something else up. So we'd either have to pay with it for higher taxes or something else instead of paying for it out of the growth dividend. So in my view, growth is good if we use it for socially important, often government-oriented uh, policies to cure what many of us in this room agree are, are social problems. Now, on uh, growth, there's this relationship between happiness or sa satisfaction and growth. And uh, David's slide showed, you know, Sweden and uh, several other countries managed to do both, uh, both to achieve relatively rapid rates of growth, especially in Sweden since 1995, uh, and. Uh, achieve a socially equal society with high levels of, of uh, satisfaction. Um, so I completely agree that G GDP is inadequate. We have measures of um, social well-being that are weighted averages of pure income per capita, life expectancy, literacy rates, poverty rates. And by those uh, broader measures of well-being, uh, instead of being 70% of the U.S., France and Germany, uh, yeah, here I'll come to the rescue of France. Uh, it's right up there at 100%. So is Germany. Sweden may be even higher than uh, the U.S. In fact, I would deduct an awful lot from the U.S. per capita income for poverty, for the unequal access to medical care, and for our horrible record on uh, both education and um, uh, life expectancy. So I'd like, um, um, Professor Gordon, for you to talk about um, the time period I'm actually looking forward to when we tax current workers and corporations to pay for Social Security and Medicare. I think that, um, just like it has been for the past 20 years, be a source of aggregate demand and a source of a spur for innovation when we redistribute income from workers and corporations and give them to the vulnerable elderly who need more incomes for aggregate demands? I cannot tell a lie. 
I have a simple package for Social Security solutions that has been absolutely unvarying for 20 years. Uh, I've been with economists who, who all agree with this, the following three points. Uh, and uh, we say things to each other like, we could fix Social Security in 10 minutes. Uh, we don't need to have this endless hassle. Number one, <coughs> index retirement ages to life expectancy. If we had done that back in 30 years ago at the time of the Greenspan Commission, uh, we would have gradually advanced the age of retirement. I mean, from my point of view, retirement is an unmitigated horror to contemplate. Uh, and we have me much larger share of the population than 50 years ago who are no longer working at back-breaking manual jobs, who are working in offices, who get the social contact by being with other workers. We have lots of sociological evidence that people may love the golf <coughs> and the swimming pool for the first year of retirement, but then they get, uh, they get bored. So that's the first of the three solutions, is to gradually index uh, retirement ages. Uh, the second one, I must, as a card-carrying member of the Boston Commission, uh, endorse a shift in the type of price index that's used uh, to <coughs> index Social Security. Uh, by any measure, the elderly have done much better than the workers who are supporting them because of the steady indexation of Social Security to a flawed measure of the consumer price index. It was even more flawed before <laughs> 1983, but it still overstates uh, inflation. Uh, and the third is you get about two-thirds or three-quarters of the way there uh, with the life expectancy and the slight <coughs> adjustment of uh, indexation. And you get the rest of the way by something very simple. We have a ceiling on Social Security taxes that's currently about 110000 So you, you pay 6% and your employer pays 6% only up to the top ceiling of 100000 Somebody makes 220000 twice as much is taxed absolutely zero on that extra 110. So that idea of the cap can be rapidly raised and as a progressive move toward more progressive taxation. And that brings you to the home base of fixing Social Security in 10 minutes. And it only took me th four minutes to explain. <laughs> I want to, um, this is a fascinating story, but I want to I wanna go back and, and have you and uh, Anwar engage a little bit, I think, in a way, because the, uh, I, I thought, and it was great that Anwar recalled David's idea about these social structures of accumulation, <coughs> which I think is one of the strongest uh, pieces of his work in the long term, is it sets what, what you have been calling the climate, et cetera. But Anwar, I thought I heard you saying that, that there was a way through industrial policy, uh, I don't, uh, and so expand on that a little bit more, is that the government, who is doing that, that allows us to get both higher real wages and higher profits, and I'm assuming then productivity growth has a big, a big piece of that story. Uh, so what's that policy, or what's that regime look like? How do you get there? D don't ask that. me, that's his idea. No, I, no, I do. <laughs> I, I want to come back, but then I'd like to get some yeah. No, I'll, I'll respond if you want to explain it a little more. Yeah, where does I the productivity growth come from? Well, let me, let me where's start. Where's this handle? Uh, <coughs> uh, I don't know. Can you hear me on this? Yeah. yeah. Okay. Let me start by first saying that I, I want to qualify my st uh, statement about the belief in capitalism is not a deep belief, but it is. Uh, <laughs> so just, just, to, just to make sure that I, I'm not tagged incorrectly here. Um, but I think Bob raised a very important point, which uh, many people have raised, which is that profits are high, why is investment so low? And the answer is we're in a great depression. This is not a recession or a pause or a stagnation or whatever. In my view, this is a great depression being <coughs> kept afloat on a sea of credit and a sea of deficit spending, we know that, but it has not been effective in increasing employment. We haven't talked about uh, direct government employment. There's no FDR in this room, or in, in that room anyway, where they should be in the White House. There are many other things. Uh, uh, medical care could uh, greatly enhance uh, 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 purchasing power because it enhances the medical industry. Uh, <coughs> people talked about education, redistribution of income. Many of these things have been mentioned, and they have been floating around. But I tried to make a distinction between those things which are relevant in a crisis 
and those things which are relevant for longer term growth. And, uh, uh, and I think it's correct to say that we could ask whether we need more productivity, but it's not, you have to be careful to say who's the we. There are different we's in this uh, discourse and firms don't care about productivity. They only care about profitability. And if productivity I impacts properly on it, they care about productivity, but it's a means to something else. So we always have to talk about the, uh, the differential impact of uh, households and firms and rich and poor and all of that. And that's why you need a state to be able to take that bigger view. That's what I meant to say at the end. I don't believe, even at a theoretical level, that the free market can address these problems in a way that we desire. I, I certainly can address them. It certainly can. Um, so uh, let me just stop there because I think Bob will say something and, then, and David and then we can pick up from there. I am extremely skeptical of government policies directed toward stimulating innovation and thereby productivity growth. And uh, let me give you <coughs> some concrete examples. Uh, if you look at the history of innovation going back to 1870, you see one thing really leap out, and that is the role of individual entrepreneurs in creating the second industrial revolution with Thomas Edison, Alexander Graham Bell, Henry Ford. And then we had a long period of corporate-led R&D, uh, led by things like the Bell Labs, <coughs> that gave us part of the computer revolution. And then all of a sudden, the entre entrepreneur came back. The government had nothing to do with Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Mark Zuckerberg, and all the creators of the third industrial revolution, which, as you saw, created a nice big productivity revival, if only uh, it had lasted longer. Now, I will qualify that <coughs> with respect to um, the NIH, the NSF, our backstops in supporting basic science in the United States, and the Defense Department had a lot to do with the invention of the Internet in the 1970s and 1980s. Uh, so it's not that the government doesn't have a role. But I think to rely on some sort of government magic, which the French used to call industrial policy, uh, to turn the wheel and suddenly revive this creaking productivity machine uh, is a false hope. Um, again, this, just let me get a word in and then we'll go back to you guys. Uh, am I on the mic now? Yeah. <coughs> okay. Um, uh, this is a response uh, uh, to Duncan and, and Bob's response. Um, and also, uh, uh, and since I was um, uh, limited on my time very strictly, uh, a, a piece <laughs> of my story got cut out. Um, so, yeah, uh, is growth necessary? I, I never meant to imply that it's, it's not a good thing. You know, growth, greed isn't always good, but growth is good. But really, only if it's if it if it's shared and and what is produced is y useful. Um, a lot of growth is defensive uh, um, expenditures that, like uh, uh, toxic waste cleanup, which is a good thing, but shouldn't have happened in the first place. So um, we need to be uh, conscious of, of what the growth consists of. Um, I think it's revealing that uh, one of Bob's um, slides pointed out that during the short period where U.S. growth, productivity growth was getting back to impressive between the mid-90s and 2005, uh, the general consensus is it was driven by retail and wholesale trade and finance. So why do we care about growth and productivity in those sectors? Well, f finance, on another slide, he points out that the general consensus, and I think that's really true, is that finance output is really overstated and, um, and um, uh, wasteful. So I think we don't really, uh, we can kind of write off finance as, uh, as a source of positive productivity growth. What about trade? Why do we care about productivity in trade? Presumably it's because trade is, uh, productivity is good because that means consumer prices fall, which means real wages increase. And that's a good thing for workers and for demand. But as my, one of my last slides showed, um, you know, these European countries didn't have the Walmarts, didn't have this productivity growth that we had, but their real wages increased. Our real wages didn't. So, so I ask, what's the, 
you know, well, it could have been worse without productivity growth in, cons in, in consumption goods. But it just goes to the point that what, it, what is being measured, what sector, and, uh, you know, it raises the question of why, why we care. Uh, I've got to say something about Walmart. <coughs> um, economist Jerry Hausman at MIT and, and a younger co-author uh, written the definitive paper showing that when Walmart comes to town, food prices go down by 25%. They go down by 20% because that's how much less Walmart charges, and the other 5% comes from competing stores having to lower uh, their prices. Do you know how much of that gets into the CPI? Zero, zero, zero. The entire cumulative effect of Walmart over the last 30 years in holding down food prices for, and prices of apparel for especially the target population that shops there, the bottom half of the income distribution, is entirely missing from the CPI. That's one of the forms of upward CPI bias that the Boston Commission reported on. Uh, so yes, productivity growth in retailing is terrific, uh, but it's caused bias in our real wage measures and our productivity measures because we haven't counted them. I'm, I'm sorry, I just want to add one more point. Uh, the, the, our real differences about productivity growth have to do with the extent to which the state creates a uh, s uh, foundation for it and channels it. And I would argue that there's very well established literature. Uh, Hajun Chang's little book, uh, which is uh, about the history of, of the development of technology in different countries and development of their, their rise to the top of the ladder, uh, mentions this. You can certainly find this in Japan. You can find mm -hmm. it in South Korea in the modern era. Mm -hmm. You can find it in Germany in the early era. You can find it in the United States in the early er era. Setting the conditions so that uh, this kind of flowering can take place and often channeling it too. There's no <coughs> question about that. We could disagree about whether that's the most efficient way or not, but that disagreement depends on our degree of faith in the free market. And here there is a difference, clearly. But the conversation regarding growth, even let's say at zero growth, you still have innovation. You still have, across the board, the rising level of um, living. And, the, you know, in real terms, as far as in your TED Talk, uh, Dr. Gordon, as far as, you know, you talked about the, the horse and buggy and, you know, the, the, the uh, pollution from that. So we are no longer having to deal with that or kerosene. So the, the, the standard of living is going up. So why is growth so important if the standard of living is still going up? It's a matter of how fast. Uh, usually the, uh, the story about the horses and the horse manure comes up in the following context. Uh, the MIT tech gurus will say, look at all this enormous stuff we're getting for free. All these free apps on our smartphones, they're not including that GDP. GDP is deeply flawed. Well, guess what? We did not count it as a gain in our standard of living when we transitioned from the horse to the motor vehicle. With the d damage to the environment of the motor vehicle is far less than the damage of the horse. Uh, think of the backbreaking work of getting rid of all that stuff. And there was that l little minor detail. Did you know that fully in, in the year 1900, fully one quarter of American agricultural land was devoted to raising feed for horses and mules? We got the gains of all of that land for export or for consumption instead of having to feed it to horses as a result of the invention of the motor vehicle. Was that ever counted in GDP? No. So for anything you say you're getting for free now, I'm going to tell you, you got 10 times more for free 100 years ago. <laughs> Professor Gordon, um, you talk about legalizing drugs. Uh, what strategy would you advise uh, a politician or a political party? Would that be something they run uh, as part of their platform, or would they try to implement it once they were uh, in power and in, in once you establish that strategy? How do you do it? That's an excellent question, but then um, almost everything I propose is politically impossible, so why not? <laughs> <laughs> why not include <laughs> legalizing drugs? You know, you, you would start, um, I would highly recommend to anybody who, who didn't see it, uh, an article by Gary Becker and Kevin Murphy in the um, Wall Street Journal sometime within the last year about the enormous costs 
uh, of our futile attempt to curtail the supply of drugs. They include 50,000 murders in Mexico connected with the drug cartels. They include at least $10 billion a year of maintaining all these people in prison and catching <coughs> more of them. They include <coughs> at least $30 billion a year in tax revenue the, gov the government could get from taxing legal drugs instead of having it all go to gangs uh, and illegal uh, activity. So I would start by talking about this as a deficit reduction measure because the cost of trying to suppress the supply is far less than the few billion that you would rightly devote to uh, rehabilitation and cures for addiction. And of course there's enormous disagreement on how much uh, drug consumption would go up uh, if you legalize everything. Uh, clearly a lot of states have been willing to start with marijuana uh, and we're well on the way to legalizing uh, marijuana, probably in another 20 years or so. Um, I'm, I'm more radical in saying we should legalize everything because I think we want to take the profit out of the drug trade and take that out as a form of, especially of black youth imprisonment. Um, and the Becker Murphy article lists the lifelong consequences for young black males as one of the biggest consequences of having our current drug regime. Uh, and that's just plain humanitarian philosophy that I think I could sell to almost anybody. But I'll tell you, I wouldn't run as my election campaign. I would sneak it in after I got elected. <laughs> one more? Yes, it, it appears that the uh, base of the American labor market is Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, it appears that the base of the American labor market uh, pyramid is overregulated, uh, meaning that direct uh, vendor licenses, uh, the vernacular being peddling licenses, are overprescribed across the country by cities, local municipalities, and states. Now, many people I don't think are aware of what kind of remuneration direct vending can afford and if you allowed people to do that you would find that and I know from direct experience uh, of myself and and people that I knew that were doing it that people can make in my case I made uh, seven hundred and seventy dollars for two hours work okay so my question is that if you have an employment crisis an executive order could lift those limitations and these people, if you get an average of 50,000 people per state that are licensed and that you can track for taxing, um, you would have 2.5 million people who are currently unemployed working, which would add to your demand for goods and services. The <coughs> I, I want to change the topic a little bit. I, I'm in favor of any kind of um, loosening up that will create jobs. If you compare New York and Chicago, there are many differences. One of them is that you don't have food trucks on every corner in Chicago because they're regulated out of existence in order to protect local restaurant owners. Uh, in New York, you have food trucks all over the place, which increases consumer choice, and you still have millions of thousands of restaurants. Uh, so that kind of overregulation is a is a bad thing, and that's a direct example of how you can create jobs by simply allowing people to do what they're currently prevented from doing. We have another kind of overregulation, uh, and uh, my attention was called to this by Jan Vig, who is the chairman of the genetics department at at uh, Albert Einstein School of Medicine in New York, uh, who wrote a fascinating book. Um, and he's an expert on the genome and progress in medical technology. And <coughs> he is very outspoken on how we are overregulating the development of new drugs. He points out there are drugs that could save thousands of lives, but they completely kill the experiment if even one test subject happens to die along the way. So um, just enormous overregulation. Lots of drugs are available in other countries that are not available here. And in addition to that, because of our messed up medical care system, uh, the American consumer bears most of the cost of developing drugs worldwide because we're the only country that doesn't put a ceiling on the price of drugs. So there, are, there is a long way to go in lots of areas involving uh, regulation.
So we, we, we get lucky every once in a while at the New School for Social Research because Bob Gordon agrees to come and talk. And, you know, it was a great talk. Really terrific. I, you know, he's so empirically grounded, rooted in kind of very, in this presentation, very straightforward accounting identities, showing, you know, ratios that over time give us meaning and policy implications. And he's not afraid of a far left policy and a far right in the same talk. It's, it's really, I think, uh, inspiring in some ways. The, the discussion was also, I thought, terrific comments by David and Anwar. I, one little story about David, which is uh, there were no econometrics in this presentation, and David used to tell me, because I also had the fortune of being a colleague of David, that uh, when he worked with uh, Bowles and Weisskopf on their, uh, s uh, their two books they did on, the, on US, American perform U US economic performance, uh, his, he was the econometrician. And Bowles and Weisskopf uh, would tell him that uh, any regression that has uh, adjusted R squared above 0.95, we throw out. So um, it's not a great joke, but it's <laughs> some of us like that joke. Anyway, uh, I, w I just want to say that not only are we lucky, but also uh, to have him occasionally. And I'd like to invite you back regularly in some way. Um, but Bob Gordon has also been a very big supporter of us even between visits. And that's uh, through the David Gordon Fellowship. And we have some of the recipients here in the room, and past and present. And it shows uh, both a love for his brother and a real belief in the kind of economics that we do here. And so I want to thank him for that. And I think the sign uh, of how important that is is just the incredible turnout we have. We have an online audience. I'd like to thank you. We have an overflow room. And we have standing room only here for really a, a really deep discussion of the future of the American economy with its theoretical implications and empirical applications. So thank you, everybody, for coming.